Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with the origin of Isaiah Bradley part two, right? The truth, red, white, and black, the story of the black Captain America. Okay. So, uh, in the previous video, we basically ended with this idea that Isaiah Bradley and these various other African Americans had all been taken by essentially the U S government whisked off to a camp that didn't really exist in Mississippi. And then basically subjected to a series of terrible processes in order to recreate Captain America, Steve Rogers, right? Because Steve Rogers was off fighting in world war II at that time and they saw him as a success and they simply wanted to create more. What this does, at least this, this second half, this conclusion, is going to give us a lot of information, especially what happened to Isaiah, but it's also going to fill in what was going on behind the scenes in terms of the fact that it's a lot more complex than we were initially told, right? So one of the first things that happens here, and, and this is one of the things we talked about in the last video, is that in order to ensure that nobody would come looking for these soldiers, that the US government had created a cover story, right? And basically said these guys had all just been killed in like bombings and different events and so on and so forth. Now, now, where a lot of the other individual families ended up more or less accepting this, Faith, the wife of Isaiah Bradley, did not. She did not accept this as an absolute truth, and at the very least, wanted to see her husband's body. The result of this is that she was kind of roadblocked every single time she tried, and every time that she was turned down, she became more and more suspicious, right? That if her husband really did die, then it's like, okay, then like, I need to find out what's going on. And when she finally saw the body, she realized something was off, right? And so what ended up happening is when she went to go visit the military, she was kind of like, okay, when I saw the body, of my husband, it was the charred body of a white man. So like, what in the world is going on here, right? Like, why is my husband's body replaced with a white guy? And so we're again, she's kind of railroaded and not really given any any actual answers outside of the fact that he was just kind of burned beyond recognition. Uh, in the end, it was just kind of, you know, just that's the way it is. And she was kind of sent on her way. Now, as she's leaving, she's met by a black member of the military who basically tells her that what ends up happening a lot of times, I don't know how true this is, but what ends up happening a lot of times is that when there's bombings that take place with regards to you know various soldiers that usually they're blown to pieces and that what the government does is try to assemble at least some variation of them in order to actually have a body in the casket and so they'll, they'll have like a suit on and things like that they'll make them look as clean as they can but like their legs might be disconnected or something like that you just won't know because there's basically they're, they're sitting in a casket and there's pants covering their legs and so it's one of the things where it's just kind of like it's the nature of this but what he does is kind of provide this kind of you know almost bottom level uh indication that like it's a cover up, right? He doesn't really say it in so many words. He doesn't really say, no, don't worry. Like your husband, it, like he didn't die in a bombing. The government's lying to you. He doesn't really say that. Instead, it's just kind of like, well, I mean, you know, they kind of put them together and, and so on. But it's kind of pointing to this idea that like the body in the casket is not your husband. But instead of just kind of leaving it and saying like, it's not your husband because the government just did the best they could with what they had. Instead, it's there's something a little more nefarious going on. But the reality of this and what she kind of walks away from is she's never going to get Isaiah back. Now, the reality of her husband is that he, alongside a few other members of the of the group, are kind of fighting out in the German Black Forest, right? And as they're going through and facing off against these Germans, and they take these guys out based on the assignment they were given by the military, they end up finding out that what they were there to do was to essentially inter intercept a, a supply line, and inside one of these trucks is a bunch of pharmaceuticals, or a bunch of uh, what look like medicines from Coke Pharmaceuticals. Now, there is a huge thing behind this, and it's not what they think it is. But from their perspective, they believe it's like bandages and medicines, and there's a huge mental toll that comes with this because they feel like they've been sent on a mission to essentially intercept supply lines to keep the Germans from being able to tend to the tend to their injured. Now, the reality of this is that is exactly what happened, right? I mean, and not not necessarily in the story, but like in World War II, uh, that's exactly what happened. There were multiple instances where the US military would engage in these supply line interceptions that were designed to basically keep Germans and Italians and members of the Axis, uh, Axis powers from being able to tend to their wounded, right? It was the one of the most effective ways ways of being able to keep them from keeping their supply lines maintained, right? Keeping their soldiers happy and healthy. In some ways, they turn it into a war of attrition. But one of the things that kind of goes on is that this creates a kind of mental toll for these guys, right? Especially for Maurice. Now, the reason why it matters for Maurice is because once they're there and they're basically in, in Portugal, and I wouldn't really call it R&R, &R, they're just kind of between missions at the moment, uh, you end up having Merritt. Now, Philip Merritt, of course, we know is one of the guys who was there in the, the outset of them all kind of being rounded up and then taken to Camp Cathcart and then ultimately taken to their final destination 
situation where they were imbued with the super soldier serum uh this guy's obviously racist right i mean it's, it's one of the things that's kind of given here he refers to them as like boys things like that and his racism will become a lot more prevalent the the you know further you get into this story but one of the things that he does is he reveals to maurice the fact that his dad killed himself that his dad killed his killed his mom and then killed himself because when they were given the news that maurice had been killed uh essentially they couldn't you know he couldn't really handle it right his dad couldn't handle it and when maurice learns that he immediately loses it now what it does is it leads to maurice actually killing one of the other guys and then attacking Merritt and breaking his collarbone and so when you have this happening and, and maurice of course essentially perishes as well basically isaiah is the only guy left and so what it does is it basically leads to uh isaiah being the sole survivor and then having a meeting with price where he's just kind of like look like it's the nature of this thing right like understand if you continue doing the missions as you're supposed to then your family will survive and while it's not necessarily on the nose the message that's being delivered here is do what we tell you to or we'll kill your family and then we'll kill you right like that kind of a thing we'll wipe it all off the face of the map because in reality it's in the best interest of the military to essentially tie up all loose ends but one of the things that's also established here by uh by reinstein is there uh, really not even just reinstein but by uh walter nagel kind of operating under the name of jeffrey reinstein is it's essentially established that maurice had a, a kind of exaggerated thyroid gland and because of that it led to like an increase in extreme emotional states and that's one of the one of the 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 problems that came with this iteration of the super soldier serum is that again steve rogers was kind of the perfect the the perfect serum was imbued with him with regards to abraham erskine everybody else like it all had some kind of flaw to it and so if there was already an existing exaggeration of the thyroid gland then the super soldier serum would enhance that at least the way that it was made by by reinstein it would exacerbate it and make it worse right and so essentially it was only a matter of time before maurice had some kind of a psychotic break and then lost it the other part of this is that you end up having isaiah being sent on a final mission but the problem is that when that mission goes down one it's radio silence but two he ends up stealing the captain america suit now the again steve rogers was actually alive and fighting in world war ii at this point in time he simply just didn't know what was going on this was essentially a backup suit right and so because of the fact that isaiah was so enamored by the idea of captain america and fighting on the side of righteousness and so on he steals what was basically the old shield of captain america or really i guess kind of the new version of captain america shield uh combined with a backup captain america suit and essentially becomes the black captain america and goes racing into what i believe is called schwarzbeet the uh it was a german camp uh it's, it's specific to this story as far as i'm aware it didn't really exist but goes racing in there and that's his mission now when he gets here this is when we really kind of start to get an explanation he takes out a few of the german guards and those guys are done pretty quickly grabs some exp uh, explosives and then goes to destroy these different warehouses they have but his actual mission is to essentially track down all the research of coke and so again we'll get a, a lot more information with regards to this guy once we get towards the end of the story but when he gets into the laboratory he ends up realizing that coke has been experimenting on people now coke's not the only person to do that something to understand and we'll talk more about this as again as we get towards the end is what was going on with regards to uh mr sinister right nathaniel essex who's also a part of this as well not this particular thing but a part of it as well but when when isaiah gets in there he finds just all these grotesque experiments some of which involve young people right kids babies different things like that the, just the the depravity of it all is so extreme and so the result of that is he he really is kind of breaking down and struggling the whole time and then a whole bunch of germans you know or a whole bunch of people are basically being put inside of a of a building and then he runs inside as well slams the door shut only to find out it's a gas chamber right and like zyklon b is getting ready to get pumped into this thing and that's going to be it right and that's exactly what happens that once he's in there the super soldier serum allows him to survive the experience but he's literally inside this room while all these jews are dying and so it's, it's a it's a little crazy because once he starts to wake up he's basically captured by the germans now while that's all going on there's a kind of explanation that's being offered by way of of essentially you know somebody in the background talking to somebody else right kind of explaining what's going on to a degree right that isaiah kind of realized that you can't save everybody things along those lines kind of speculating to a degree on what isaiah was thinking what he was going through how this whole thing unfolded and so ultimately we find out that it's his wife faith who's talking to steve rogers basically telling captain america all this stuff and so when he's kind of like so isaiah's dead like isaiah died at the camp her response is no whatever would make you think that isaiah bradley was dead and so from there you actually kind of jump back a little bit right you you or really kind of jump back before steve rogers had this meeting but after the whole events with the camp and all that kind of stuff so we're gonna have a little back and forth here for the next little bit but you end up having steve rogers who basically meets with philip Merritt, who's in lompoc federal prison out in california and this takes place about five days before the meeting that he had with faith and philip is a guy who's essentially been busted on seemingly everything right killing a federal agent commit 
a conspiracy to commit acts of domestic terrorism, gun running, money laundering, racketeering. I mean, if he did it, he's basically been thrown in jail for it. Now, there is a little bit of, of indication here that some of these charges are trumped up or fake charges just to kind of get him removed out of the equation. The reality is it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? I mean, if the government's good at anything, it's killing people without anybody knowing. So I have a hard time believing that if the government wanted this guy dead, they wouldn't just kill him, right? So it kind of seems to be to move him out of the way or he's actually guilty of all this stuff. But one of the things that he talks about is racism really kind of comes to comes to sharp relief when we end up finding out that somewhere along the line, Reinstein was executed, right? That, uh, that, that Walter Nagel was basically killed. And that when that happened, it was at a meeting that he had where he had met Philip Merritt. And while Philip Merritt was kind of a, a young person in the military and Steve Rogers was kind of there with everybody else. So Philip was just kind of a guy who was there that wasn't really of any significant notice that when, uh, when, when Walter Nagel was killed, that you ended up having somebody who basically raced off to his laboratory and torched it. And that's when he realizes Philip Merritt was the guy who did it. That he basically betrayed the country, right? That he was essentially working alongside the Germans, or at least that seemed to be the case. And that's when his racism full on comes out. That in the warehouse that he had, there was a lot of German propaganda. And then there was also the uh, the suit of Captain America that Isaiah Bradley had been wearing. And so that's kind of the, the bonkers situation is because the more the conversation goes down, the more that Philip Merritt starts talking about things, how like black Americans were trying to achieve equal rights and that, you know, black Americans need to be used for cannon fodder effectively. And that the Germans had it right when they were basically rounding up people who were deemed to be undesirable and then gassing them, turning them into some kind of a forced labor, working them to death, whatever the case was. But like, there was no reason to believe that black Americans could in any form or fashion be useful in, uh, in society as a whole without just being kind of thrown out there as cannon fodder, right? You know, and even goes as far as to refer to Isaiah Bradley as Captain Americoon, right? So like the racism here coming from this guy is pretty extreme. Now, something to understand, because I'm sure a lot of people who are kind of looking for a reason to be mad will like take this and run with it and say like, see, Marvel's racist. That's not really true, right? The important thing to understand when it comes to period pieces like this, it's designed to reflect one, how far, th how much things have changed in different ways. And two, the backwards mindsets of various people. And then, and, and, you know, to kind of illustrate that point, you do end up seeing instances where like a racial term gets thrown in, but it's not being racist for the sake of being racist, right? It's designed to illustrate a point. And so what you end up doing is switching over to Isaiah Bradley after he had essentially, you know, escaped the, or at least, you know, woken up inside of one of the gas chambers and he's essentially been snatched up and brought towards the, you know, brought to the German Fuhrer. And that's kind of the crazy thing is because what he ends up really doing is trying to like put forward this idea that Isaiah Bradley should work for them. And he actually ends up bringing in like the German minister of propaganda. Now, one thing to understand about what Germany did back in the day during World War II is propaganda was a huge part of the German of the, the German war effort. And in fact, during events like like when German when Germany was taking Stalingrad, right, they would go through and routinely blare, right? They would just play these these kind of broadcasts where they would tell like the Russian soldiers, the, the Soviet soldiers, like surrender to us and we'll treat you better than your than your leaders do. Because at that point in time, uh, if you were part of the Red Army, they would actually kill you for retreating, right? Which is one of the reasons why so many Russian soldiers died. Because like if you they would they would just like send you forward and you would fight and if you threw down your arms and you just ran backwards you'd get killed by your own officers right by your own your own commanders it was pretty backwards and it was pretty extreme but as far as as stalin was concerned it was the only way to force people to fight and so because of that you kind of have isaiah who doesn't really take it seriously right that that the you know that goebbels and those guys are kind of like hey look like you know understand like your people are being treated terribly in the united states right like your your people come out of slavery right you've never really had equal rights in comparison to white americans you experience racism at seeming every turn. We here in Germany, we're a lot more enlightened than, than America is. We're far more enlightened. We're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to make the world a better place. So come side with us and we'll take care of your people, right? We'll take care of black Americans. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a tough sell if you know anything about Germany. <laughs> and that's why Isaiah is just kind of like, no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Like my wife would kill me if I sided with the Germans. So obviously he's not even remotely taking these guys seriously. And so following that, you know, basically the German Fuhrer is just like throw them in a vehicle you know, and then we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll have him eliminated. But then the question kind of becomes like, if this guy is capable of what he's done so far, then like, uh, like the Americans have been, have gotten pretty far with Coke's formula, right? So again, kind of an important thing going on here and something to keep in the back of your head. Now, ultimately, of course, Isaiah is told by, by the German Fuhrer, Hey, look, uh, we're going to get you cleaned up. We're going to treat your wounds and then we're going to let you go. Isaiah is no fool, right? He's like, 
these guys are gonna kill me. But there's not much he can do, right? There's not a whole lot that he can do there. Instead, what ends up happening is that you kind of switch back to Philip Merritt and the meeting that Captain America had with him, along with uh, along with the, the FBI agent, of course, who's, you know, half black, or at least uh, has German in his blood. And ultimately, like when they go to leave, Philip asks uh, Captain America to basically give him an autograph. Now, Captain America does, but there's a price that's to be paid for it. And so while they're leaving, you end up having this guy who starts talking to Steve Rogers and saying, you know, there's a story that my grandfather, uh, you know, grandfather Klaus always told. He always told this story and it was interesting. The way this works is that after Isaiah Bradley is basically taken by the Germans for the intention of being executed, that the, the, the convoy is essentially knocked over, right? Like the, the road to Auschwitz, is where, which is where he's supposed to be going, is essentially intercepted by a handful of black soldiers. And one of these guys is the grandfather of this FBI agent. And the way this works, the way it's kind of explained to us is that Isaiah Bradley had essentially been taken by these guys and then essentially brought into a series of, uh, onto a series of supply lines and more or less brought back to the United States, right? These are black soldiers, right? These are, these are our black allied soldiers. And so it's a, it's a cool thing to see that he was, he is a, a black Captain America saved by black Americans who were fighting during World War II. And so what you end up doing is kind of jumping back in at least as far as two days ago, where you have Captain America meeting with, uh, with Walker Price. Now, Walker Price is the guy who was running that, right? That military officer, the guy who was a dick. Uh, he was the one that was running everything. This is Captain America basically confronting him. And he essentially says like, you know, I want to know what's going on here, right? Like, I want to know everything that's happening. And and he really kind of asked him about like, about like Isaiah Bradley, but he says, I need to explain, you know, how you could wind up running Coke International and, and what you have to do with Isaiah Bradley and all that stuff. And Walker's response is, it's all the same story. And so this is where you kind of get this huge exposition on what's going on. And you actually, you actually learn some really intriguing things here. So one of the first things that's established here is that the notion of Germany using what was in effect uh, ethnic cleansing models was based on the United States. And that's true. So to sidetrack from this story for a second, kind of delve here in the real world, there was a guy by the name of Harry Laughlin, and he basically lived or, or was head of the eugenics record office from 1910 to 1939. But important thing to understand here is that you had in the United States what was called the Immigration Act of 1924. Back during that point in time and in the years leading up to it, the United States practiced eugenics. The way it worked is the U.S. would basically determine what individuals were considered the most desirable. Those individuals who were uh, Chinese and Japanese were considered the least desirable. And those individuals from like, uh, from, from Eastern Europe were considered a little more desirable than Chinese or Japanese, but still undesirable overall. And so what the United States basically did is it created this kind of hierarchy, right? Those individuals who were considered the least desirable to the to the most desirable. And that those who were kind of classified below with a certain threshold, the US would involuntarily sterilize them. When they came into the US, they would make sure that they couldn't have any kids because the United States wanted to keep America ethnically cleansed. They wanted to keep it ethnically pure. And it wasn't just the US. It was also Britain who did the same thing. And Germany to a degree before the before the Fuhrer and before the, the Germans rose to power, before like, you know, everything popped off with, with regards to the war. And so because of that, uh, the idea of what was going on during World War II in the concentration camps was rooted in what took place in the United States. That, you know, as far as, as the more modern era, the US kind of spearheaded that stuff. And that's one of the things that he talks about here, right? That like Francis Galton was the one who came up with the idea of eugenics in the first place, the science of improving the stock. And it was basically just uh, a, a movement in the United States to sterilize individuals who were deemed to be uh, undesirable and ensure they couldn't procreate in the United States and taint the gene pool. That was the whole belief of America at that point in time. It was not believed entirely in America. That's something that I want to clarify. It was not a wholly supported movement by everybody in the United States, but those in position of power believed it was a good idea. One of the things that came out of this is the Super Soldier Project. Now, this is where I want to kind of wrap everything back together and give you guys a more clear picture here. So when you look at something like Weapons Plus, you look at the Super soldier project, all that kind of stuff. It really all starts with Nathaniel Essex, Mr. Sinister, right? He was a guy who believed that mutants were slowly rising to prominence that individuals were developing powers. And he was curious about how all that DNA worked. And so during World War II, he operated inside of a concentration camp, performing all kinds of heinous experiments on people uh, that he believed possessed what was a mutant gene or trying to understand the human genome better so he could predict who was going to become a mutant and who wouldn't. Now, ultimately, when the, the forces of his concentration camp were liberated by the invaders, right? So Captain America, Bucky Barnes, Name of the Submariner, the original human torch Jim Hammond, that he essentially went underground. But his research had been discovered by a guy named Truett Hudson, who ended up changing his name. But Truett Hudson had used all this stuff and then created what was in effect, quote unquote, the uh, the Weapons Plus Project as we more or less know it today. But the precursor to the Weapons Plus Project and the precursor to Project Wide Awake came by way of like Isaiah Bradley and eugenics, experimenting and understanding the human genome to eliminate undesirable people. But the antithesis to that is 
because if we can eliminate undesirable people by essentially sterilizing them, is it possible to manipulate the human genome to create desirable people? And the Germans were the ones who came up with that kind of secondary thought process. And that's why you saw the United States government sending in Nick Fury and the Howling Commandos to snatch up Abraham Erskine and whisk him to the United States for his super soldier serum, which could be used to create the perfect super soldier. Now, once that project was kind of off to the races and you had Truett Hudson and all them, that's when it goes into the United States creating and, and using it as a model to kind of contain and control the mutant threat. That's where the precursor element of Project Wide Awake comes into play, right? Because it's one thing to say, okay, like let's create super soldiers or create the perfect person, the perfect being, and then like fill our society with that. But then when mutants start popping up and there's people with extraordinary powers, then the role of the government becomes self-preservation. And so then it's like, okay, well then let's just find a way to contain and control the mutant threat, which is why Captain America was originally supposed to be brought back, presumably mind wiped, and then reconditioned to go forward and be the first of a new line of super soldiers, assuming that Abraham Erskine hadn't died. But again, that's 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 how it was all kind of supposed to play out. That's kind of the big, broad perception of it. Um, We can do a, a far more nuanced explanation, kind of run through the whole timeline. If you guys are interested, I don't remember whether we have a video on that or not. I don't believe we do. I don't think we have a video where we kind of explain the timeline of the Weapons Plus project, the, the creation of Captain America, all the other Weapons Plus or all the other weapons projects that were created, you know, how it involves and how it brings in like Blue Marvel, Adam Brashear, how it ties in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah Bradley, how it all leads into like Wolverine and then eventually Deadpool and all that kind of stuff. I don't think we've done that, right? So it, it might behoove us to kind of do this, this huge explanation video, kind of breaking down Weapons Plus. But the reality is that uh, the actions of Price are really pretty heinous here, right? And it's one of the things where he says like, hey, yeah, we did some pretty shady things, but that's just the nature of war, right? It's just the way things go. Uh, so, I mean, I'm not going to apologize for it, but the important thing is that originally you had Coke and Reinstein or, or uh, Walter Nagel, if you want to call him that, and they were in effect the same thing, right? They were kind of working on the same project, but ultimately they were sent to the United States for the purpose of showcasing the ability to move eugenics beyond simply just forced sterilization of undesirable people and actually create individuals who were of a higher, a higher stock, quote unquote. But when the war broke out, you had Koch who went back to Germany and you had Reinstein who stayed here. And so the, the race was basically on. You had Germany trying to create their own super soldiers. And then you had the United States trying to create theirs. And all of it came in the aftermath of Abraham Erskine dying. Everybody was trying to create new Captain America type guys, new super soldiers. And Reinstein and Koch were just a couple of examples of that. There were a lot of others who were doing it too. Again, Truett Hudson, who went eventually changed his name to Abraham Cornelius. Uh, you, you had all kinds of stuff that was going on. Right? You had all these things that were that were playing out. But with regards to this great big huge revelation and the fact that, that Steve Rogers is kind of being confronted with the, the idea that his origin is rooted in the idea of removing undesirable people from society, that what we also find out that he had done is he had essentially, you know, used a whole bunch of the money that he got in terms of back pay from his time in the military and bought up enough stock options in Coke International that he can appear at a, at a, at a shareholder meeting. And he's bringing the entire military record of, of Price with him and is going to dump all that information out there, right? And basically tell the world what Price is about. And so because of the fact that he's kind of the, the, the head of the company, that would be huge, right? It'd be a huge revelation because Philip Merritt was the one that handed all that information over. And so you end up having Steve Rogers, you know, kind of picking up in the current moment right now, Steve Rogers goes and visits with Faith. And when that happens, you basically have them kind of talking, leading into the moment where she, you know, essentially talks about everything that was going on with regards to Isaiah and all that kind of stuff. And so once she takes off her headdress, you know, we, she basically says like, I will take you to meet Isaiah Bradley, but there's something that you need to understand here, right? The impact of the super soldier serum as it was given to you was a perfected version, right? You are the perfect human being. As far as Isaiah Bradley goes, he was given an imperfect one. And so one of the side effects of what happened is that he was ultimately sterilized, right? It kept him from being able to have any kids. Now, luckily for us, we had a daughter before that took place. But one of the other side effects that came from this is he's kind of been reduced to a rudimentary state. He doesn't really speak anymore and he's more child than adult. And so she's like, that's something that you need to be prepared for. You need to be aware of that. And so Steve Rogers goes to meet with Isaiah Bradley. And the crazy thing about this, and that's that's one of the, the cool concepts here, Isaiah Bradley is exceedingly well known in the black community, right? Within the black community, everybody knows who Isaiah Bradley is. And he's met with everyone, right? He met with Nelson Mandela. He met with Ma uh, met with Malcolm X. He met with all kinds of people, James Brown, all kinds of guys, right? Even, even like Bono from U2, which I don't really know if I would call that an achievement, right? Bono's an asshole. But the fact remains that it's, it's one of these things where within the black community, he's highly celebrated, right? As the black Captain America. And it's one of those concepts, and, and it's not really something that's explored until you get into the crew. But one of the things behind Isaiah Bradley is that he is, was almost considered to be a myth, right? It's, it's one of those things where like, it's, it's a champion of the black community that no one really knows about, that it's very, very tight knit, very closed off. And unless you're within the black community or you know people in the black
black community that are willing to tell you about him, you would never know he even existed in the first place. And so it was kind of a crazy thing that goes on because Steve Rogers goes to visit him and, and is just kind of enamored by him, right? There's a, there's a lot of sadness and guilt that goes into this because of everything Isaiah Bradley had been through that any chance of having a full on meaningful life was stripped by the federal government from him being able to achieve those things, right? To go on and to see his family grow and prosper, them having more children, right? All the, the, the tormented things that he'd seen, the kind of things he put up with, you know, the fact that he lost his ability to function on a high, on a high level, and it's kind of been reduced to a child who's also been sterilized. Steve Rogers takes a lot of guilt with this, you know, and, and while it's not necessarily Steve Rogers fault directly, the fact that he didn't know that there was a black counterpart to himself out there is something that he struggles with. And so he really is here in a lot of ways to make amends and to say, you know, as a person who represents what are supposed to be the greatest ideals of America, America's failed you. America's failed you in the worst way. And so while I can't make up for that in the most grand sense, what I can do is try to bring at least some merit of satisfaction to your life. And so what he does is he actually gives him the old Captain America uniform that he wore, the one that he wore during World War II, which brings a huge amount of happiness to, to Isaiah Bradley, right? And the two of them end up getting a bit of a picture together that's taken by faith. And that's where the story ends. Uh, but Isaiah Bradley's story is amazing. That's why I told you guys, truth, red, white, and black is amazing. And here's a funny thing. You guys were the ones who told me about it beforehand. I didn't initially know this existed, right? I was like, what in the world? And then, and then you guys were like, like, I want to say maybe a year or two ago, you guys were like, you should cover truth, red, white, and black. And it really is a great story, right? It's an incredibly great story. So yeah, Isaiah Bradley, this is his origin, guys. This is, this is the origin of this guy. And it's cool. So with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Court. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.